Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to another event in um, the latest of our series of free practice management webinars. This is the 19th free webinar we've produced since March, and there are many more in the pipeline. I'm really excited to announce that from next month, we'll also be providing free legal webinars in partnership with sets of chambers. We already have around 25 courses in the pipeline, and these will all be free. This Zoom event is in webinar mode rather than meetings mode. That means we cannot see or hear you. Today's topic is confidentiality, and our speaker is the truly brilliant Nick Hanning. Nick has got a wealth of legal practice, practice management and regulatory experience. He qualified as a fellow of Silex in 1990, and in 2000, he was one of the small group to qualify as the solicitor's first ever legal executive advocates. And in 2009, again, he was one of the first legal executives to become a partner in a solicitor's practice. In May of this year, he was formally appointed as a deputy district judge. He continues to practice as a lawyer in a consultancy capacity with Anthony Gold solicitors. And I'm very pleased that he's developed a deep expertise in data protection law. He's a data protection officer and regularly advises our retainer clients and others about the GDPR and data protection issues. He's got vast experience in regulatory issues. He was a Silex council member for 10 years, served as Silex president in the year 2012 to 13, and was appointed to the board of Silex regulation in October, 2019. He has worked closely on finance, legal services reform and judicial appointments, whilst also working on the successful application for independent practice rights. Now, a word about questions. Please use the Q&A facility to ask questions. It's likely that we won't have time to answer all of your queries. We shall, however, answer all questions after the webinar and provide you with a link to the answers. This session is being recorded. A link to the recording together with the slides will be sent to you. This is an interactive webinar and you will be asked to vote on a number of questions. Now, if you haven't already heard Nick say so, please be ready to vote by going to www.menti.com and entering the code 13685073. I'll now hand over to Nick. Uh, thank you so much, David. Um, is there a blush emoji to put up on screen? Because that was rather, uh, it was very kind of you, David, in, in your introduction. Not um, at hey, all. Everybody, yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll just repeat what David was saying about um, logging on for www.menti.com. Um, I don't think we can, I might be able to type that in. Um, into here. Um, hopefully that link may may help someone ask for a link rather than just the, uh, it was quite a short one, and then you'll be asked to enter a code. Uh, six people have managed it, I think, so far, so hopefully some more. But we'll, we'll be there in a few minutes. Um, today uh, is little, this webinar is about confidentiality. Um, and the intent is not to be overly um, legalistic about it or overly complicated or difficult. It's really about trying to be practical. So what we'll do, that's a very, very boring slide, skip that one. Uh, what we'll do is look at uh, where our confidentiality obligations are, where they come from, um, have a brief look at the GDPR obligations and how they interact. Um, but then hopefully, as I say, trying to be more practical is to look at areas where it can go wrong. Um, and more importantly, perhaps when it does go wrong, because we're all going to make mistakes, these things do go wrong um, and we uh, all the time, uh, how to cope, what do we do when that happens? Um, and we'll wrap that up with a little bit of a checklist about things that we recommend you should put in place or to help to, to deal with these kind of things. Um, but first of all, why are there reasons to be careful? 
Um, and the answer, of course, is yes. The number one reason I suggest um, is around reputation. Um, if it gets into the public domain that you are not careful with your confidentiality and data obligations, then that has a very negative impact on your reputation um, and you will lose business. Um, so that's number, number one, probably the most important reason. The other one, which I think is important, um, is the amount of time it can take up having to deal with these things. Um, when they go wrong and you have to go around doing investigations, uh, keeping records, telling people, making reports, the, the more serious it is, the more time it takes up. And that's time you can't charge for. Uh, it's all gone. Um, and we've all got more than enough work to be getting on with already. We really don't need a whole load of extra work um, uh, for which we're not going to get paid. And on the subject of money, well, in theory, you could get fined. Um, the ICO um, has the power to fine you for data breaches. Um, that's not necessarily going to be very common, as we'll, as we'll see. But it may cost you in terms of potentially having to compensate a client. If they complain to Leo about you, um, you may have to um, pay some compensation. Come what may, you are probably going to lose them as a client if you've messed up their data. Um, and you may have to write off bills that you've already delivered or not charged for time you spent. It's all an expense. And last, and <laughs> um, I may disagree with me the order in which I've put these, um, but worst case scenario, you could find yourself getting struck off. Um, I don't think you will ever be struck off for a data breach. We'll, we'll look at that again in a bit later. But you, if you're not open and honest about it, if you don't deal with it effectively, that's, that's more of a possibility. And that is horrendously draconian. It's really the reason it's last in the list is because it's, it's quite remote, but, but be alive to it. But those are all reasons that we should be careful. Um, these examples, these are some examples of, of ICO um, data protection fines, um, and I'm, which I've tried to find some, some, some legalistic ones. Um, an employment services company uh, was fined at 60,000 um, pounds because of the theft of a laptop. So nothing that was necessarily done wrong, but the laptop um, had personal information on it, wasn't properly secured. So when it went, that data went to and could have got into the public domain, cost them 60 grand. Um, Hertfordshire County Council, two faxes, only two faxes, but very serious, highly sensitive information. Um, cases involving child sex abuse and care proceedings, but sent to the wrong wrong place twice in two weeks, a hundred grand. Um, a solicitor who was only fined, he was only fined a thousand pounds. Some of you may remember this. Uh, he, he made the headlines. He was quite infamous for a time. Um, he made quite a lot of money um, sending out letters on behalf of uh, copyright holders accusing um, home computer users of illegal file sharing because they could monitor um, IP addresses from which stuff had been downloaded and they fired off thousands of letters to addresses um, accusing them of illegal file sharing and demanding money. Um, made a lot of money out of it um, until it was determined that he had acted improperly. Um, his business in fact then I think folded as a result of that. So he would have been fined quite a lot more um, for his, his data breach. Um, but by then the firm had gone and he was an individual there and he fined him a thousand. Um, so uh, yeah, that was quite a serious breach. 6,000 6, computer users um, were, was, was revealed. But I think probably one of the most um, uh, shocking, um, striking examples of something going wrong um, is uh, the independent inquiry into child sexual abuse who you think would take extreme care to maintain confidentiality. Um, but they were fined 200 grand for revealing the identities of possible abuse victims. Um, and they did that in a mass email, you know, really in a lesson for us all that we all know about this, but we tend to so easy to forget it. Uh, they sent a mass email to 90 participants in the inquiry 
So these are obviously, uh, as you might imagine, uh, people who had experience around child sexual abuse. Now, very sensibly, the email, as we're all taught and we know what to do, is, to, is you use the blind copy function um, so that nobody can see any other email addresses. Well, they did that correctly, at least first time around. They realized that there was a mistake in the email, so they had to resend it. And on the second occasion, when they sent the correction, somebody forgot to use BCC and put everybody's email address in the to field. So all 90 email addresses were seen, could be seen by all the recipients. And 52 of them, like so many of us probably with our personal email addresses, 52 had full names. Major, major cock up. So leaving aside all those reasons, why in truth, what, where does this come from? Where does this, why, why do we have this obligation of confidentiality? We're just professional, we're just doing a job. Why, why should we be, have all this? Well, the answer of course, um, didn't really need me to ask the question, did you? is because we have regulatory professional obligations to do so. And for those who want some chapter and verse, it's the Solicitor's Regulation Authority Code of Conduct, uh, paragraph 6.3, imposes an explicit obligation to keep the affairs of current and former clients confidential unless disclosure is required or permitted by law or the client consents. So of course it's not absolute, you don't have to go to your grave um, holding secrets. If the client consents, then, then it's okay, you can release. Now that is not new. Um, the code of conduct is quite new. That's because they keep changing it, don't they? Um, but it's, it's not a new obligation. Um, that's been the position at common law for about 400 years um, since lawyers were, certainly the Law Society and, and solicitors came about. It's also consistent with a statutory obligation, which has now been imposed by the Legal Services Act, um, which many of you, I'm sure, know now regulates, uh, the, regulates the regulation of legal activities. Um, and section one, so you know it's important, it's in the very first section of the Act, um, sets out the professional principles which apply to lawyers, and that specifically includes an obligation, a principle that the affairs of clients should be kept confidential. So this brings us neatly to our very first question. So I hope lots of you have already had a chance to get onto Menti and are ready to do this. Um, the question is, we've just established that the obligation of confidentiality definitely applies to solicitors because it's in the SRA code of conduct but does it apply to others? So if you go to the page, what you should now see, hopefully, if you've entered that code, is a list of um, other persons, types of people you may be employing in your firms or working alongside. And the question is, does the duty of confidentiality apply to those people? So I've just been updated that at least one person has answered. We can have a look. There's quite a few people on this. Uh, we've got about a hundred, well over a hundred people um, watching. So we're going to be quite strict on time because if we waited for everybody um, to reply, it might take a long time. But you're doing well. That's 44 so far. Yep, nice, nice comment in a chat about lawyers. Yes, because we're all so busy, we're all working on trains, or we used to be working on trains back in the old days when you were allowed on a train. Okay, 50, 50 odd. I'll give it maybe another 30 seconds or so. So after 55 have answered, the average, I don't know if you, if you see it as well, is 0.9. That means that 90% effectively have said yes and 10% have said no. They all seem to be broadly the same, which is interesting. 
Um, so thus far, overall, no one is um, thinking it applies to one group of people, but not the others. Uh, we're, we've been on 57 for a while, so I'm sorry if you're trying to get on and haven't answered, but I'll, I'll move on. So we know it applies to solicitors. Does it apply to barristers? Yes, obviously. I mean, fairly obvious that it does. Um, your authority for that is that the Legal Services Act, as uh, mentioned, they're regulated by the Legal Services Act in the same way as solicitors. But of course, they have their own code of conduct as well. Um, I, I'll be honest, I've not bothered looking up exactly which paragraph it is, um, but we can, we can be 100% certain there will be a, an obligation of confidentiality. The same goes for Silex lawyers. Um, I always like to mention them because as David mentioned, I am one. Um, we are also uh, regulated and governed by the Legal Services Act. So we're subject to that statutory obligation. And we too have a code of conduct um, imposed uh, that we subscribe to through Silex regulation. And um, we have to maintain confidentiality through that. Um, I put Silex members specifically as, a, as an example because Slightly unusually, Silex regulation does regulate non-lawyers. Um, certain grades of membership come within the jurisdiction of Silex regulation and are regulated as professionals, um, even though they are not yet professional, they are not yet qualified lawyers. So they too are bound by the code of conduct. Uh, trainee solicitors are in pretty much the same boat because the SRA code of conduct um, applies to the firm and it applies to everybody in it so that includes training solicitors which also makes the rest of these questions quite easy um, because a paralegal may not may be regulated may be a member of the um, association of paralegals or one of their professional bodies um, but even if not the SRA code of conduct applies because it applies to all the staff so yes that applies to the secretaries receptionists everybody else um, sensible advice um, and I'm sure you already do this if you're an employer is to ensure that your contracts of employment for your staff um, contain explicit obligations of a confidentiality um, if for no other reason than to make sure that everybody is fully aware of them and, and knows to take it very very seriously. We're going to ask a second question. We have established then that the protection of confidential information is a fundamental feature of our relationship with our clients. But the question is, does it apply all the time? Hopefully your screen is updated if you're on Menti and you should now see a list of options. The question is, does the obligation to keep information confidential apply in all these situations as well? Uh, this is separating people out. This is much more fun. Look, we've got the hope, hope. Hopefully, you see the. Um, well, you're seeing my screen, aren't you? So, of course, you can see this. Um, I mean, most of them are fairly obvious, but maybe a bit more doubt in one's mind about a couple of them. That's uh, 40, well, you can, you can see as well as I can. I don't know why I'm telling you stuff you can read on screen, you know. We're up to about, we're up to 48. Um, we slowed up before at about 55, 56. So I'll maybe just give it a few more seconds just to see. It's gonna be interesting how much people enjoy the questions is uh, how quickly the uh, answers dry up. The number of people answering risks diminishing each at each question, doesn't it? Okay, well, well we're over 50 um, and so far I can leave it on screen for the moment. I'm a hundred percent, not not surprisingly, um, appreciate that the it applies to current clients. 90% uh, and that may be a rough average, but uh, say that it applies to a former client 
Um, and the answer to that is if it does apply to a former client, the fact they're no longer a client um, does not get us off the hook. Um, a third, about 30% are saying that it, uh, it, it, it applies even when the clients are given consent to disclosure. Well, it's kind of yes and no. The reality, of course, is no, they've consented to disclosure, so you don't need to keep it confidential anymore. Um, but the reason, and I suspect what's behind the 30% is, well, that rather depends on what the client's consented to, doesn't it? They may have consented to disclose some information, but not other information, in which point you still have a duty to keep information confidential. You're only released within the parameters um, of, 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 what, of what you've been authorized to release. Um, really, really irritatingly, um, it does still apply even when the client is suing you, um, when they bring a complaint, when they've fallen out with you, when they've gone elsewhere in a huff, when they won't pay their bill, you still owe them a duty of confidentiality. Annoying, isn't it? Um, perhaps slightly doesn't seem terribly intuitive, but it's true. It still applies when the client is dead. This is not like defamation, where if the client dies, you can say what you like about them. You still have to keep their information confidential, um, but you owe the duty instead now to the personal representatives and it will be their job to tell you what you can and can't uh, disclose. But there is an exception, um, not surprising, I suppose that it's right at the very end then. Uh, there is no duty of confidentiality if the client is perpetrating um, a fraud or another crime. Um, and we'll move on. I basically did that while it was still on screen because I thought it was more fun to see the answers changing. Um, but you'll have this uh, slide in, uh, available, won't you, um, to, to refer to if you really need to. But there's a, a really recent authority, Gartside and Outram, um, 1857. Uh, well, it feels recent to me anyway. Um, I've been at law school a couple of years by then. So uh, there is an exception. So let me strike fear into your heart by mentioning GDPR. You remember all the fun, and I think it's fun, I love GDPR. Um, two years ago, wasn't there a lot of excitement around it? Um, well, actually, if you want to be really picky, if anyone if you want to be clever with people, when people start talking about the GDPR, you can say, oh, that's no longer really relevant. And the reason it's no longer relevant is because um, it's been applied in the UK, in England and Wales and the UK by the Data Protection Act 2018, which introduces and um, brings GDPR into UK law as the Data Protection Act, um, with some exceptions and qualifications as, as it was permitted. So very strictly speaking, if you want to be a real dick, which is the kind of thing that I do, um, you can say, oh, no, no, GDPR no longer relevant. It's only Data Protection Act 2018 now. It's, I get on really well at parties. So how does this impact on our duty of confidentiality? Well, first and foremost, what the Data Protection Act imposes on us is a duty to comply with the GDPR privacy principles which includes an obligation to deal with data lawfully. And that, and also, in fact, as a specific obligation under uh, GDPR, I'm still gonna call it GDPR anyway, uh, to deal with data with integrity and confidentiality. So that's a primary thing. Does it actually change anything? Well, in my view, no, it doesn't, because your duty, your professional and regulatory duty of confidentiality overrides even the Data Protection Act. Just because GDPR or the Data Protection Act allows you potentially to share data or to do something with the data, you can't actually do that unless you're allowed to do so with your client's consent or consistent with your duty of confidentiality. That duty to your client trumps GDPR and Data Protection Act. That said, it does impose some additional requirements, um, many of which can sound quite onerous in terms of undertaking uh, data audits, keeping records of data breaches, making data protection reports, which we'll look at in a second. Um, but I mean, some of them are a little bit onerous, but the reality is that their intention is to impose discipline, um, which is useful um, in terms of running your practice and, and maintaining um, good systems helps helps run the practice efficiently and thereby also mitigating risks because the more procedures 
you put in place to prevent these problems, uh, the, the less frequent they, they will be. So what? What actually is a breach of confidentiality? Well, there are very obvious examples, but I mean, obvious examples, ringing up the other side and telling them your client secrets. Um, fairly obviously, we can all recognize that as a breach of confidentiality. But here's another little bit of interaction for you. Um, which of these is a breach of confidentiality? What should I say, is, could be? That's a trouble. Funnily enough, we, we spent some time earlier changing these from a, uh, a scale, a sliding scale of one to 10 to a binary answer, yes or no. And thinking about it now, looking at these questions, I suspect some of you are going, well, it might be, but maybe not. So I'd quite like to have a sliding scale of seven out of 10. Um, sorry, you haven't. So you just have to plunk, plunk with the yes or no, and then we'll have a chat about how they can be and how they can't be. you're all very good you're very thoughtful you obviously thought a lot about this so i've done this a few times now and i'll be honest some of the people on other courses were not as prescient or aware um of what could amount to a breach um as, as you guys have been you've been very good um I'll, I'll try and do the same if i can remember all the answers um, which i suppose i should do really but um I'll, I'll leave it up on screen while we're doing it so that people can um, see if there's any change. And it's a bit brighter than the normal screens, isn't it? Um, exactly, it does depend. Uh, first of all, leaving a file on the train. Well, if you leave a file, you remember those old paper files we used to have um, that we would cart around to court um, before we had it all on an iPad or something? Um, or we didn't even, well, in the days when we went to court, now we go, go to court remotely as well. But in, if, yeah, of course, if you leave a file on the train uh, with papers in it, very obviously a breach of confidentiality, a horrendous, um, terrifying, uh, cold sweat in the middle of the night breach of confidentiality. Um, if you lose your phone, well, I think as somebody has, uh, has posted, it absolutely depends, doesn't it? Um, if you've taken really good security measures, it may require fingerprint access to be able to get into it um, or else a good code. Um, so even if you've lost it, um, people may not be able to get into it and really can't get any data off it. You may not have data on it, um, but most of us these days have our emails, our work emails on the phone. So there's, there's definitely a danger. Um, some of these things can be bypassed. So it's not a, it's not a, good, a good situation, um, but it may be, it's an awful lot better than losing a paper file, obviously. If you send a letter to the wrong address, well, yes, of course, almost certainly. Um, it's a bit of a nightmare. The, the, the severity depends really on what was in the letter. Um, and you just pray it wasn't a parole report or a um, CAFCAS report or a medical report about something really sensitive. Um, if it's, but it, there's a, a variety of nightmare scenarios there. Um, and the worst of it can actually posting a letter to the wrong address is that but the bigger risk is that it actually lands up with a neighbor. Um, so it's somebody who knows the intended recipient. So it's kind of worse than if it goes to a complete stranger halfway across the country or moving on to sending an email across halfway across the world. Um, again, technically a data breach. Again, it depends a little bit what's in it. Um, you've got a, a better opportunity to take measures there by, for example, encrypting um, or, or password protecting any attachments. Um, and only having confidential information in the attachments would save it. You can also get lucky as to who receives it. Um, advised a, a client a while ago, they'd uh, sent an email to the wrong address by accident and it had landed in the inbox of a former police officer um, who promptly rang up and said, I've got this email, I've not read it. I can see that it's not intended for me just to let you know I've deleted it um, completely without reading or opening anything. So it's no problem. So yes strictly speaking there was a breach but it was dealt with and there was no, no problems um i thought confirming to a caller you act for someone 
um, was uh, was was quite a nice one to put in. But you're you're way ahead of me. You were far too clever. Um, strictly speaking, yeah. If someone rings up and says, "Oh, you act for Bobby Jones. Can I speak to whoever's dealing with it?" Um, and you go, "Oh, yeah, Bobby. Yeah." Um, you've just revealed that you're acting for Bobby, um, and that may not be information that Bobby wants anybody else to have. Particularly if you are a criminal specialist firm, that's giving one thing away. You're a family firm. It may be a family matter that is still confidential. So do take care with that. Um, I think we've all told our partners um, about an interesting case, um, but I'm sure that when we've done so, we've been careful not to give away any identities, um, which within reason is going to be fine, but you do need to be careful. Um, you know, it's not just a name that identifies someone, is it? Um, you know, Mrs. Jones at the hairdressers, who runs the hairdressers. You know, there's lots of ways of identifying people, so do take care. Um, I know we all trust our partners because they're wonderful, wonderful people, um, but just let, let's be careful. Yeah, and as, as someone is posting, absolutely right, leaving a file in reception. The reason that can easily be a breach of confidentiality is because we have a habit of writing the client's name in great big letters on the front of the file, which is handy to know what file it is. Um, not handy if you leave it on a table, not just in reception, but any public access area. If people have to walk through um, a, a shared area, room, an open plan office to get to a meeting room, you've got the same problem. Think too then about your screens, people's screens, if they've got to walk past or come back through and they see people's screens, all the same problems. Um, and look at that, putting papers in the bin. You, you guys are amazingly well-trained and thoughtful. 90% recognize a problem right away that you don't know what happens to that rubbish. Um, and it, often there've been horror stories in the press before of, papers that's being found on a local dump and turn out to be someone's medical records or confidential papers. So it's shredding, shredding people, shredding. Keep your client related waste in separate bins if needs be um, and send all that and send that all off for shredding. So we've actually done all that. We, uh, but I thought it was more fun to that. So absolute worst nightmare can I get struck off for any of those? Well, no, almost certainly not. Um, mistakes happen. By and large, if you make a mistake of that nature, even perhaps you know, one of the worst sounding ones or what have you, you're going to get a wrap over the knuckles. As we talked about, you've got reputational issues, you've got um, uh, problems in terms of you might lose the client, you might lose some money, or certainly some compensation perhaps to the client, possibly a fine but you're not going to get struck off unless, unless there are some caveats here. I think first and foremost, if it's a systemic, systemic failure that you've not addressed, that this has happened again and again and again. And if you're still in practice and you keep making the same mistakes, um, well, you're probably not running a great business, you, but you're going to get um, treated very harshly if, if you repeat the same things and don't put in place corrective measures. Um, an obvious one is if it's deliberate. Um, and there are examples that those of you who are familiar with the, the Morrison's case about the, the release of data by, by the accountant there, that was deliberate, um, didn't just get struck off, he got sent to prison uh, for deliberately uh, revealing data. Um, so obvious penalties there. And the other one, the other big one is, is lying. Um, as you probably know, the SRA in particular, all the professions, um, if there's one thing they hate more than anything else, it's dishonesty. Um, because if you can't be trusted to tell the truth, how can you be trusted to represent a client? Um, and you, you may remember, um, quite not too long ago, the, the very junior solicitor, she was very, either, she was, she was no longer a trainee. She was newly qualified. Uh, she worked at Capsticks. Um, and she, I can't remember whether it was a briefcase or a computer uh, that she met, she left on a train. Um, and when she first went to the office, she lied about it. She said that, it, I can't remember exactly what lie, she, what, what lie she told, but it was a relatively minor white lie about losing it or where she'd lost it or how it had got lost. And then she came clean and she was struck off um, because she had told the initial fib. Um, now, there's universal um, uh, condemnation, to be honest, of, of that decision. 
Um, I think I'm pretty sure she has appealed. She's got some pro bono assistance, um, and she is 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 appealing it. And I and I hope somebody sees a bit of sense and gives her a, a bit of a break because you know she was very young. She panicked as often is the case. But if I can send one, send all of you, particularly perhaps younger junior staff, home with one lesson that I know your supervisors and partners will endorse is please don't panic. Of course, you're going to be upset. Of course, you're going to have a moment of panic. But if you make a mistake, anything of this nature, any kind of mistake, just talk to somebody about it as fast as possible. However bad you think it is, it can probably be solved. Um, but it can only be solved if you actually talk about it. And usually it can be solved quickly. Um, and the, the golden rule is tell the truth. Go to somebody else. They will help you sort it out. Another head is always clearer in those situations. And I can speak from personal experience. Um, I've made plenty of mistakes in my time. Um, and you go through that period of cold sweat. You want to hide it. You're desperately ashamed. But actually, the minute you've shared it with somebody else, A, you feel a lot better. B, they're much more sensible than you because they're distant from it and they can sort, you can sort it. So, But never, ever lie about these things. That is, a, that is how you get yourself struck off. Right, lecture over. Oh, no, it's not over, is it? It's carrying on. We're still lecturing. So what happens? How do we actually deal with the breach when it happens? Well, number one, as I've just said, is, is go and talk to somebody about it. But there may be some other things you could do. Um, perhaps, perhaps I'm talking rubbish. Um, question four, what should you do uh, when a breach has occurred? Hopefully your screen is updated. You can see now these, these various options some of which I hope are obviously a good idea, and some of which obviously I hope are a bad idea. <laughs> and some, I think it's being reflected right away in the answers is you don't know for sure we'll talk about that that's part of the reason for asking the question uh, is precisely for that <laughs> for that reason <laughs> i can't believe it no one said deny everything <sighs> Well, well let, let's rattle through. Um, yeah, absolutely. Someone is, is already on, on the ball about, let's take an intern. D deny everything, obviously not. Um, you'll see on the next slide, it's deny everything Baldrick, for those of you who remember um, the wonderful episode of uh, Blackadder in which Baldrick is about to give evidence and is told to deny everything. The first question is, are you Baldrick? No. Nope. Um, so no, obviously, do not deny everything. Tell the client, wow, that's a tricky one because frankly that's the last thing we really want to do isn't it if we've just messed up on their data the last thing we want to do is tell them um, so if we can avoid it then great um, but I think be really careful with that um, in terms of a legal obligation to tell them we'll, we'll look at that in a moment in, in terms of uh, data protection act and GDPR obligation the, 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 the main thing I would say is if there's any risk that the client is going to find out from somebody else make sure you tell them because if you've messed up their data there's nothing the one the only thing that's worse than messing up their data is them learning about that from somebody else um, and discovering that you knew and hadn't told them i mean that just makes us look awful so uh, that would be one of my uh, general rules is um to work out if, they, if, if they're going to find out anyway then better off tell them uh, report to ico and sra we'll look at in a second well absolutely right someone is posted it, it, it depends. Um, undertake a risk assessment. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you need to do that in order to determine whether to report to the ICO or, um, and the client legally. Um, but also internally, you want to know why it happened. Um, so for that same reason, sorry, I've gone. Uh, can I go back? Yeah, I can. Um, for that same reason, record the breach. Um, that's a legal obligation under Data Protection Act for GDPR. Um, and um, then take corrective measures, obviously, if you can. It may be as simple as, um, as, 
of changing something or just training or what have you. Um, then the last one, yeah, I mean, you're way, you're really, really an amazingly well-informed audience. Um, review recorded breaches regularly. The whole point is that in the, in the, in the life of a busy practitioner, you record the breach, you deal with it, then you go away and you get on with something else and you don't necessarily think about it very much, but take the time at least once a year, maybe more often if you can, if you can do it, to go through your list of all the recorded breaches. You should be doing this part of your compliance anyway at a, at a senior level, your CULP um, level and your COFA. Um, you should be looking at this, look at your breaches to see, are they being repeated? Because if they are, then you can identify uh, systemic problems and, and take action about them. Um, it's one of the best episodes of Blackadder in the world ever, that, that episode of Baldrick. Anyway, um, a risk assessment. Under Data Protection Act and um, uh, GDPR obligations, if there is a data breach, you are required effectively to carry out a risk assessment um, and to determine the degree of risk of harm to the data subject because of the breach. If there is a risk of harm coming to the data subject, then you must report it to the ICO and you're required to report it within 72 hours of your knowing about the breach. That's, that's, that's only three days. That's not even working hours either. Um, so you're in deep to do if it happens on a, you discover on a Friday, you basically got to tell them the next working day. Um, it's a really strict obligation, um, but only if there is a risk of harm coming to the data subject. If there is a serious risk of harm, then you also have to tell the data subject. Now that can be your get out. If there's no way of the data subjects learning um, about it for, for um, then, um, and there's no serious risk to them, you don't have to tell them. So we take that example of the email going to the retired police officer. It was a entirely legitimate to assess the risk of harm to that individual as being um, non-existent, practically non-existent, um, because you, this was a police officer, understood professional obligations and had dealt with it promptly and without any harm coming. So no need to report it to anyone. Um, on screen, you can see this little form which gives you a variety of type of uh, risk criteria to be looking at um, and uh, what the assessment involves. Um, oh gosh, we're running a little bit late, aren't we? Um, I guess um, only because a reminder for something else is coming up. Um, we should be okay, hopefully. Um, this is a form that's, a, that's available um, to retain a clients. Um, we can send you one of these um, it's something that's provided in any event as part of a GDPR um, data assessment uh, day and, and report if you want it. Um, but it provides a way of going through the types of issues that arise, um, the type of harm that can happen, that, that, that um, can exist, um, and a way of considering what's low risk, what's high risk. Um, as I said earlier, if, if the client is going gonna, is gonna to find out anyway, for goodness sake, tell them. In terms of reporting to the SRA, if it's a serious breach, then again, you have a, um, you're in breach of your regulatory obligations. And if it's serious, then you have to report to the SRA right away. If it's a minor breach, as you know, you don't need to report, um, but you may need to make a report at the end of the year as part of your annual return. And obviously multiple minor breaches become a serious breach. So you may also need to report if the same things are happening. But in any event, internally identify the causes um, and take mitigating steps. Record and monitor is really the watchword here to try and stop these things happening. Um, well, we've kind of just seen that on, on the form side. So you, can, you can see the, this is not going to be news to you, the sort of examples of harm that can arise. Um, this is a little bit nanny still. It's one of those sort of Vinci Works training programs, isn't it, to flag up these things. Um, but there are genuine, genuine issues around potential for identity fraud, um, witnesses, intim witness intimidation, but particularly, and there's a lot of stories of um, addresses, for example, of uh, spouses or partners who are, um, have got the benefit of an injunction or protection against domestic violence. Um, but their, their, their new whereabouts have unwittingly been revealed because um, of, of some document that's gone astray or been sent to the wrong place. 
and that can genuinely put people at risk. So do, do take care. So we've gone through all of that. You probably the answers to these should be fairly obvious. Well, very quickly, when do you need to make a report? Do you think if these things happen? Right, because I'm talking way too much, so we're running a little bit behind and I don't want to keep you um, too much longer. It's, it's, a, it's a commitment you've made and I don't, don't want to abuse that. Um, so over 40 have, replied, have answered so far. So if you leave your laptop on the train, well, I guess it's going to depend, isn't it? I mean, was it encrypted? Um, could people access the laptop and get data off it um, if they could? Yeah, probably you might you may well have to report. Um, but if it was well protected, you might you, you might feel you don't really need to. Um, you can there are quite strict or strong security measures you can take now. You can have the data protected, access protected with the dongle, so that it just simply won't work unless unless the dongle is in. Um, that may be overkill for a, a lot of us, but. Uh, uh, sending an email to the wrong address, I think that 0 0.5 that we see on screen is pretty accurate representation. It depends very much, doesn't it? Um, where's it gone? What was in it? Uh, that's all part of the risk assessment. Accidentally deleting data, um, I would say 0 0.3 is actually putting it a bit high. I mean, it's pretty unlikely. Um, what what risk is, is there to the data subject um, if you've accidentally deleted some data on your system? Um, with luck, well, I mean, not even with luck. I mean, you should have a backup so you can just restore the backup and really no harm has come. But it was technically, it's a breach under data protection principles because you lost data. If you don't have the data, um, you're the one that's really going to have the major problem. Worst case scenario is you have to ring around everyone or get in touch with everyone and get the data back, recollect it. So that's a pain, uh, it's a nuisance. Um, but it's not really a, a very major risk um, or there's no real harm. Leaving a file on a train, well, yeah, almost certainly, aren't you? You've lost the file, you've got papers on there, um, which are in the public domain, you've no idea what's happened to them. You just hope and pray they've been thrown away um, without anything worse happening. Um, you I suppose hope and pray someone finds it and brings it back to the office for you. Um, but uh, a, a really good Samaritan. Sending a letter to the wrong address, yeah, probably 0 0.6 is probably a fair assessment. Um, if you treat that as being that 60% of the time you might need to report it. Um, IT system held to ransom, difficult one really. Um, depends what they say they're gonna do to your systems if you don't pay. Um, unfortunately, now some of the threats are that they will release your data into the public domain. So um, a bit of a, a real problem. Um, office being burled. Build. I'm not sure what that is. Um, I think <laughs> um, I'll take the blame. <laughs> I can't spell. I mean, it's supposed to be burgled, but uh, <laughs> build is something new. Um, you never have to report burls. Build, I don't know how to say it, but if you were burgled, yeah, again, it would depend, wouldn't it? If you've lost a load of files, your filing cabinets have all been broken into and papers stolen, um, you're going to be safer, I think, to report. Um, if it's if you can see that it's only you know your screens have been swiped and your petty cash tin um but filing cabinets look okay then you, you're probably okay of course that does um uh, assume that you keep your filing cabinets locked which we all do right every night right, before you actually go leave go home hmm i thought so so we've done all that um so ico recommendations this is all fairly basic stuff. Um, look at the slides later if you want, but you're talking about physical security, making sure that you've got good security, people can't break in easily, that you're looking at sensible arrangements for disposal of waste, um, 
and keeping your IT equipment secure. Um, when it comes to cyber security, I mean, we can do a whole course on this, um, but um, system security, the one thing I would uh, remind you to think about is that not everybody in the office needs access to all the data. An um, obvious example is your staff records, HR records, payroll records. Um, maybe only a few of your staff and, and partners need access to that. You don't, it's, it's not just about protecting data from outside, it's within as well. Um, there's privacy um, that your staff are entitled to. Um, be careful about device security with um, phones, personal laptops, um, especially now when people are working from home. Um, something has to be really alive to within the office, within the practice management is uh, making sure that systems at home are secure um, or as secure as you can make them. So a checklist. Um, this is what we would recommend. Um, slightly self-interested because it sounds a little bit and I suppose it is kind of trying to sell a service, but we do offer a GDPR data audit. Um, that's a good idea for a couple of reasons. One, because it's actually, strictly speaking, a, a requirement under the Data Protection Act is that you undertake your own data audit. Um, but it does give a, a really good opportunity to think about and understand your own data issues, what data you've got, how you handle it, um, and how you could improve that and what your obligations are. Um, it also, as I've shown, I hope, um, provide some quite helpful materials in terms of your data audit and uh, uh, actual data record of all the data you hold. Um, another important action is to provide staff training. Well, you've just done that, hopefully, uh, depending on how you organize this internally. Um, another thing I would mention is email checker software. Um, DG Legal does, and this is not selling a service, it's, it's providing a service, we don't charge for it. Uh, there is a, 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 a thing we can, a piece of software we can provide which um, adds a little pop-up window to Outlook before you send an email asking you to check who it's going to and what the attachments are. Um, it's not necessarily hugely sophisticated. Um, we know it doesn't necessarily always interact well with case management systems that are plugged into Outlook. Um, and some people find it quite annoying because it's, it's another bloody pop-up, it's another click. Um, and all of a sudden, clicking is the world's worst activity, isn't it? We don't like to do too many of them. Um, but it is a useful check and you may find it useful if you fi do find a big problem internally of, of the wrong, of emails going to the wrong place. Because don't forget that, that really easy habit of um, when the autofill comes up. So you, you're trying to send me an email and you, you type in N you see it fill in, you go, oh, great, that's done. Um, but actually it wasn't me at all. It was some other Nick and, you know, it's all, all goes a bit pear-shaped. Uh, clear desk policy. I mean, that's really easy to implement, isn't it, to be honest. Um, bring your own device policies, really important. Um, if you're a retainer client, you already have these because we can provide them, work with you to tailor them for, 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 your, um, uh, for your business. Um, but you ought to be thinking about obviously password protection and possibly remote wipe. There are apps that will allow you to do that. There are even some apps now, I think, which will separate out business data and personal data and enable um, that, that to be recognized and only the business data is wiped um, without, but you can do that without the user's consent, which is where there can be some issues <laughs> with your staff potentially, um, rebellions. Um, but it's important if they leave or if it's lost, you want to be able to remote wipe and obviously check and secure your IT systems. Um, I mean, that's a, that's a given really, isn't it? So sorry, I've run over a little bit, I think, have I? Um, oh, actually, no, four minutes to go. Oh, well, talk about good timing. Um, yeah, any questions? Well, Nick, I don't know if you can uh, see, see the, the Q&A box, but I, I will read out uh, yeah. the questions for those that cannot. Um, one question which was asked earlier on in the webinar is what should you do in these situations, e.g. if contains sensitive information stroke court documents, or will this be dealt with later? Well, that's a shame I didn't see it at the time because I'm not quite sure what those situations are, what were we doing at 3.34? Yeah. Um, hopefully, um, or, or hopefully we've, we've done it. 
unless it was the same person um, who asked the next one. I, well, I, they can come back and uh, yeah. either either uh, elaborate in the Q and A or send us an email, and we'll be able to make sure that's that's properly answered. Well, thank you, Gregory. I like you very much. <laughs> Uh, next one, regarding remote hearings, a judge recently criticised one of our solicitors for not sending the full trial bundle to a liability witness for the purposes of the hearing. Surely where the bundle would include our client's medical notes and records, medico legal reports, etc. This cannot be correct and only the relevant documents should be sent to a witness, for example, the liability evidence. If we did what the judge required, surely this would be a breach of confidentiality. Well, no, I do take I do take the point, um, but I think I mean I think if they're giving evidence at the trial, I mean if you apply that to the situation, if it were a, a normal here, you know, the or should I say a normal hearing, an old-fashioned hearing, um, a personal hearing, the, the the full trial bundle would be on 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 the witness table or in the witness box wouldn't it so i think yeah they're, i mean you you don't need to worry too much about data protection confidentiality because it's in the context of court proceedings so you're okay um there's no breach of confidentiality there there's no breach of data protection um your the, the disclosure is is fully authorized and and, and, and lawful um but i it's a bit different. I mean, again, I think there is an there is an element of difference because if you send a full trial bundle for a remote hearing, they've they've got the whole thing on their computer. They've got it for as long as they like. Um, you've no idea what they do with it um, after the trial is over. They could theoretically keep it. I mean, there, there may be something around. I don't know if there's any. I hadn't really thought of that before until I was thinking out loud now. So whether there's any kind of software you could get that would automatically. Um, allow Mission Impossible would, would would delete it a few hours later. At least in a personal hearing, um, they're in the witness box. They give their evidence that they're gone, and they no longer have the trial bundle. So that's a tricky one. I, it's a bit unfair to criticise, um, but I can guess what happened. Presumably, the witness was referred to something which wasn't in the bundle that they'd been sent. So of course, the judge gets really irritated. Um, so good question. Very difficult situation. Okay, I'm going to let this um, overrun by just a few minutes because we've got a couple of other interesting questions before we uh, tie up. Um, first of all, um, the person asked the questions about what do we do in these situations? Well, that was uh, yeah. in relation to data breaches where you've posted to the wrong address, but I think you covered that later on when you did so. polling. Thank you. Yeah, thank so you that's... for um, updating us on that, anonymous attendee. <laughs> that's, that's what they're all coming up as. Uh, so. But, uh, so cool. uh, but hopefully, yeah, hopefully. Was, I mean, the main thing, of course, is is to undertake a risk assessment and 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 work from um, and take action from that. Um, okay, good. Thank you. If the police require a client's file or the other party's file, what risks will there be? Is that a breach of confidentiality? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the law society and SR advice would be not to. Shouldn't, just, shouldn't release the file without a court order. Um, now there are some exceptions, there are some um, uh, provisions which allow you to provide information uh, to law enforcement and uh, data protection legislation, but I would um, stick to your professional obligations. And unless the information they're asking for is really um, anodyne, um, say, I'm sorry, no, need a court order. You can't be criticized for uh, insisting on a court order. Absolutely. And uh, let's just have this last uh, final question and then we'll then we'll finish. Do you have any advice or tips for working from home and trying to maintain confidentiality and other members of a household, especially when taking phone calls or attending remote hearings? Um, well, that uh, next week, I think. Sorry? I think you, you might be covering that next week. Uh, yes, we are doing something next week. Um, uh, don't think I'm doing that bit, but I think we're definitely covering it next week. Um, but it, it is it is difficult. I mean, it's you know for for those um, of us who maybe are, are, are lucky. I mean, I'm lucky. I've got a, a room out here in my garden, um, so I can have complete confidentiality. Although in the summer, I have to be careful and shut the windows. <laughs> um, but but you know, many people, it's it's a really trying time. Some people are working in their kitchen. 
um, working, living in a shared house with effectively maybe strangers, but still trying to do stuff. You just have to try and do the best you can. Um, and I think when it comes to things like phone calls and remote hearings, you have to make a decision as to whether you can really do those. Um, and for what, if you're speaking to the client or to the other side, say, I need to explain I'm at home. It's not 100% confidential because other people might hear. So I'm going to be very limited in what I can say. Um, if you're doing a hearing, you might have to say, I I, I'm going to have to go into the office to do it. Um, you know, it's not against the law to go into the office. You're entitled uh, to go into the office. So to, even in lockdown, um, you may feel uncomfortable about that. And if, if you're having to shield or you're, you're vulnerable, you don't want to go into the office for that reason, then you need to discuss that with your principal or um, make a decision um, with, with your employer about whether you go in or not. But you know, if it's if it's really that that type of hearing and it's going to be that that confidential, then I would say facilities in the office and make sure that the office is safe. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Nick. Uh, I thought that was really really good. Um, just to mention that our next webinar is called "Whose Data Is It Anyway," where will be joined by the Information Commissioner's Office and the other presenters will be Nick, um, my other colleague Matt Howgates and, and myself. Uh, it will take place on Tuesday the 15th of December and after that the next practice management webinar will be on the 20th of January where we explain what the COFA is supposed to be doing in practice. Finally, if you appreciated today's webinar, I'd be absolutely delighted if you could leave a Google rating and review, that uh, certainly motivates us to continue delivering free webinars. And I'll finish off by just thanking you all for attending, and I hope you have uh, a good evening. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Bye. yeah I'll, just, I'll just echo that, David. Thank you, everyone, and particularly for answering the questions as we went through. It's fun. It makes it a bit more fun for me. Right, thank you. Okay. Goodbye, everyone. Bye-bye.